Hi, I'm Berger. Welcome to Denmark, one of Europe's leaders in the heating market transition. Berger, thank you very much for doing this interview with us today. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the Danish district heating landscape? Uh, the Danish district heating landscape is quite large, you could say. We have a lot of district heating. Uh, more than two-thirds of the population uh, enjoy the benefits of district heating in their homes. Uh, we have a lot of companies supplying. It's mainly uh, based on municipal uh, um, utilities, but we have approximately 340, 50 uh, cooperatives also supplying district heating to their owners. Uh, recently, uh, the EU struck a deal to cut final energy consumption across the block by 11.7 percent by 2030. I'm sure you're welcoming this this news, but is it is it enough to raise the case for a heating and cooling, especially uh, that it might be overshadowed by over other um, solution like electrification and hydrogen? I, I'm not sure the, 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 the target itself matters much to district heating. What matters for this, or the heating sector, what matters to the heating sector is the development of our building sector. Uh, because uh, the building sector in Europe is quite inefficient. On one side, we have to develop the building sector, make our buildings much more energy efficient, and at the same time also develop the supply that these buildings are still going to need for heating and other purposes. Energy communities, you mentioned cooperation as well, but uh, if we look at those um, which gain an enormous momentum in Europe uh, these days, how is it going in, uh, in Denmark? Um, and because they have, there's here a great potential to drive uh, reduction as well. Um, we have a lot of energy community, communities, you can say. Uh, we just call them energy cooperatives. Mm. Uh, we have a strong tradition for that in both the electricity sector and the district heating and other sectors. I think it might be an instrument uh, that can be much used in other countries, uh, particularly in cities in other countries, because I think they are looking into instruments somehow to mobilize the heating sector for their energy transition. Cities can do a lot for the heating sector, not perhaps so much for the transport sect uh, transportation sector, Mm -hmm. uh, and not so much for electricity, that's a European uh, market where heating is local and I think cities are very concerned about how they can become sustainable and since heating is the dominant demand in, uh, in energy, uh, the, heating, the local heating market absolutely matters for them. Back to, uh, to a larger vision of a European, the European energy transition and energy mix uh, needed, can you tell us a bit more about Denmark versus Europe on this front? Well, I think when it comes to the heating market, we were probably early movers. Uh, we moved uh, pretty much almost already after the first energy crisis. Now we have the second energy crisis. They're not that dissimilar. Uh, prices going up, uh, lack of supply and things like that, that hit Denmark very hard in the 70s. And we never forgot the lesson as far as heating is concerned. So we started developing that. Now we have the infrastructure, we have district heating and so on. So we have you could say the early mover move benefit of having an infrastructure that we can transition rather than having to transition individual buildings. Uh, in Denmark, uh, 1.8 million households are covered with district heating. All we have to do is change the supply in 500 networks, not 1.8 million buildings. So, you know, other countries can do the same thing, but they're just a little bit behind. Can you share uh, with us a little bit more around geothermal? Yeah, this, this is something that we have been looking into for some years. Uh, we've, we have some existing projects. Denmark is not Iceland, uh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, we have to go, when we drill deep, what we will find is relatively low temperature, so something has to be upgraded with heat pump and so. Uh, but there is also uh, a lot of risk involved in this, so we, 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 we have to develop some solutions to cover the risk associated with the, these high investments. Uh, we have seen a, a, a renewed interest. Uh, some of the big players in the, in the market in Denmark, Mask and Danfoss, have formed a consortium to trying to develop uh, 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 geothermal uh, district heating. And they have inter entered into some memorandums of understanding with some of our major cities to develop resources uh, and have that integrated in district heating. So we are looking, you know, th th there's a positive outlook for, for, for geothermal in Denmark. Other countries, some countries have abundant resources, Iceland a good example, but also France, Hungary and so on. Uh, but it, it's definitely a technology that has to both de be developed and has to find some kind of, well, a functioning market model to, to grow further. What drives you uh, day after day, uh, waking up and uh, taking on all the challenges around the energy transition and district heating in your case? 
because district heating is district heating or the heating sector is fascinating. I'm I'm out of you know I'm not an engineer. I'm a political scientist, uh, and district heating is not so much about the basic technology. Basically, it's lukewarm water and pipes. How how it's not that simple. It's the context. We the heating sector involves so many stakeholders and so many players that have to be involved to to solve this problem. So that that is what ticks me uh, in this uh, in this work. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.